Welcome to our class on the Romanticism. Um, romanticism, it says here 1800, but really we can say that Romanticism is anywhere from 1800 to 1830. It's a period of art that um, looks at the emotional aspect of humanity and nature, um, the uncontrollable parts. It's a direct reaction to the kind of government-based republicanism of neoclassicism. Um, and it is not an organized school. So it's mostly art historians grouping people together who we really feel like a lot of them are kind of making similar stylistic and um, content choices. Um, so to really kind of help you master that, we kind of organize it in this, this, um, this acronym or but not in nomic vice. Pine, P is for past, the longing for the medieval past or pre-industrial Europe. So as the um, in, um, industrial revolution is, is, is moving up in, in Europe, particularly in England, people start to feel a lot of stress about this, about the kind of really um, dramatic changes of um, humanity. Um, and they, they express this through the art. Um, irrational in our mind, insanity. They also were interested in the human psyche. Um, and the kind of um, problems with uh, dreaming or madness. Um, asylums become a big issue during this time, um, and that's all reflected in the art. Nature and the longing of purity of nature, but also seeing nature as something that they can't control. Nature is, can be wild and uncontrollable. And finally, emotion, so kind of the emotion over reason, passion, um, and exoticism. So because of the kind of colonialism and the trade, there was a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of evidence of um, fabrics, materials, and whatnot from a lot of areas, particularly during this period, it was mostly from what we would consider to be sort of the Middle East and the Near East now. Um, um, and that has to do with a lot of kind of trade back and forth. For example, right here, I have um, Henry Fuseli's The Nightmare. Um, this is actually from 1781. Um, it's one of the earliest romantic pieces. And if you kind of look at it for a bit, um, and remember how we try and kind of just go to where the artist wants us to go first. He's brightened her up, which is very light compared to this kind of dark background. So we're here to see her dramatic uh, fall. She looks like she has the vapors or something. And sitting on top of her is what comes next to our eye, which is this figure the troll like monster kind of pushing her down well and if you go back and look she has pink cheeks so we know she's not uh deceased instead we look at it we see um that maybe this is her sleeping and what she might be thinking about when she's sleeping and around the corner right there is a horse um and this really kind of shows us the kind of um lack of reason in this in this painting um it's it's all this fear that the, the horse does not have eyeballs, um, which is worrisome. And then you can look at her table here. She's got a vial of something here. She's also got some fabrics that would be considered to be a little bit more exotic. And this is an oil and canvas. It was three feet by four feet, so it's large but not overwhelming. Um, the piece is really supposed to kind of make us, you know, be able to try and see into this her psyche and figure out what's going on in her bad dreams. Here we have William Blake. So you guys might have heard of him for poetry, um, but he actually was an artist too. Um, and he created a series of um, works, and this is from it. The series of works is called The Ancient of Days. Um, this is about, this is from um, the frontispiece of the one called Europe, A Prophecy. Um, it's a metal relief etching and it's hand colored by him. Um, and actually you can see it at the JP Morgan Library in New York City. And you can see that this is not natural, like this doesn't look real. This is a mystical landscape. It's abstract, actually, um, but it's God creating the earth. Um, and so he's kind of made this kind of larger than life figure. You'll notice that he has the kind of musculature that you might see in a Michelangelo, but without the kind of overbearingness. There's also the shadow on this is flattened a bit. So we can see the depth of his knee and whatnot. Um, and we can see that he is on a surface here. But everything else is sort of kind of more graphic oriented. So we're seeing a real shift. Um, and a lot of books, the book industry during this period was really thriving and they were coming up with very kind of simplistic graphic ways to easily print things. Now this was done very beautifully. So this is not, this is not, this is like a very high end, which is why it's considered to be, um, you know, 
art history, <laughs> but but it just kind of shows you how um, even an industry like um, book binding can kind of influence the art world. We have more at another etching. This one is from Francisco Goya. Um, his work is known to be romantic because it's very so psychological. This is um, translated to be the sleep of reason produces monsters. This too is an etching. Um, it's with aqua tint, which is another style of print. Um, and you can see that as he um, is trying to kind of sleep, he's got all of these animals um, going around him, whether they be owls or bats or whatnot. Um, it's, it looks a little scary and Goya means for you to think that. There was a point when Goya was actually painting for the royal family. So Goya wrote for the, um, painted for the royal family. And he honestly, this is one of those paintings that people think is quite unflattering of the family. It's family Charles the Fourth. It's from 1800. Um, it's an oil on canvas. And it's at the Prado. So some people who went on the Spain trip might have seen it. Um, now, there's some beautiful things about this. If you look at her dress here, there's kind of this overwhelming fabric. It's not as detailed as we previously would have seen. Um, you'll see that Goya creates illusion of light, illusion of pattern. Um, he makes, we, we know that it's really pretty, but he doesn't need to finish it. See, if you look down here, he's not finishing the detail. We are filling that in in our head knowing um, that it was probably quite beautiful, and that's one of the brilliancies of Goya. He starts he starts to kind of push people to let things be unfinished. But look closely at the eyes and the facial expressions of this family, okay? So um, many have said that King Charles looks pretty vacant. His eyes are looking off. He's not giving us eye contact. Um, there's really no expression on his face. The guy behind him looks pretty frustrated. She looks like she's questioning something. The kid looks overwhelmed. She's looking at us sort of, but a little bit off and confused. And over here, we've got someone who's really kind of stressed out. So really we're talking about like, this is not a complimentary uh, picture of the royal family. Here you have Goya himself looking at you, wondering why is he there painting it. Um, it is not a complimentary photo uh, painting. If you think back to, many other um, leaders that you've seen, you would know that this is not a great portrait. So in some ways, the artist is now able to run a commentary on the, um, the royalty versus the other way. So the artist in the 1800s has more power in that way. If you look here, this is um, a very famous Goya painting called The Third of May. It's from 1808. And it has to do with Napoleonic forces coming in um, and, and sort of attacking um, in, in Spain. Um, it's an eight foot by 13 foot. You can see the, the blood. Um, you can see that this person is a victim. The faceless um, machinery of this um, guard, these guards kind of coming in and trying to shoot peasantry people. Um, and you know, the kind of city in the back of the village in the background and people fleeing. Um, and up here you have menacing birds. You kind of have to look very carefully for that. Goya is trying to appeal to your emotion. Um, this is not a celebratory uh, war battle thing like we saw in the neoclassical period. This is um, the kind of the, what happens to humanity during war. It is the same for this print series he did called There's Nothing to Be Done, where you see people being um, killed um, and whatnot. And this is stuff, clearly these pe innocent people are victims um, and, they're, and he is siding with the small everyday person, which is a big shift in art during this period. And one of the reasons why um, I really enjoy the 18th and 19th century is that the artist is able to be more of a, um, participate in politics more. This is Goya's uh, one of my favorite paintings in all time. <laughs> it's called Saturn devouring one of his children. It's uh, 1819 to 1823, we think. Um, the, this was actually found in his house when he died. He had a series of mythological paintings that were very dark and scary that he had hanging in his own home. And his son had actually taken off the walls and, um, you know, uh, mounted it onto a canvas. So these were frescoes originally in his home. Um, and they're very disturbing, but honestly, what is not disturbing about Saturn devouring one of his children, it's actually a very classic story, um, makes Saturn look m monstrous um, and, and whatnot. Um, so it's a very psychological and romantic uh, picture in that way. 
Uh, this is one of the most political paintings of its time. This is called, um, this is by uh, Turner. Uh, Turner was known, uh, he was a British artist who actually painted seaside scapes and he often would spend, um, he would go to the seaside in England and he would uh, uh, pay for to paint from a window um, of the sea. And here you have um, a, a slave ship has thrown bodies and people over the side of it. Um, and it's one of the first kind of abolitionist um, paintings that was um, done in the salon. So Turner was very controversial because this was not a, uh, you know, a political uh, military battle. This was not um, a, a beautiful landscape or like a bowl of fruit. He put this up on the salon so that people could see that even um, as um, uh, slavery is sort of at this end in England, there is still slavery occurring um, and that it is awful and gory. Um, and um, and so when you actually see closely, it's, it's it, at first from far away, people, he actually pulled people in because they were so used to his landscapes. So far away, they'd see the light and the pretty, you know, there's all this light up here and how pretty it is. But then when they got close and they saw it, they saw that there were bodies thrashing. Um, it is um, quite an upsetting painting, um, but it really pulled in this British upper class that um, would, um, you know, not consider those types of uh, discussions in public. This is uh, by Thomas Cole. It's in an American painter. Um, it's called the Oxbow. It's very famous because it's it's talking about the landscape, um, and there's kind of this ominous scene, overwhelming um, weather that's kind of coming into the beautiful valley that's down here. Um, this is uh, in New York, so this would have been the West during this period. Western New York would have been kind of pretty far out in the early 1800s, but it, it um, shows kind of the beauty and the wildness of this vast American landscape that was so different from what Europe had. And you look right here and the people are shrunk to be very small. So humans are so small against nature in this one. Delacroix, liberty uh, leading the people. People often think that this has to do with the French Revolution. It does not. It has to do with another revolution that happens in the 1830s. And Delacroix is using the um, kind of the symbol of liberty. But one of the ways you can know it's not the French Revolution is if you look at people's dress, it's a little bit later. Um, and so it's kind of reminding people of um, all of this is worth it. There's bodies strewn everywhere in ways that are kind of pretty dramatic. She's climbing over them. This The future of France is kind of leading the way with his little guns. Um, but this is a very dramatic, it uses a very classical triangle form, but there's a lot of body and movement. Look at her um, drapery, uh, it's pretty. And then back here, you just see crowds of people. So that's what makes it romantic. Here we have um, Ing which I always struggle with, um, La Grande Odalesque. So this is in the same school of some of the Odalesques we've seen before. Um, he's doing a few things that are a little different than um, what we saw with um, our other painters, um, like Titian and whatnot. He has elongated her back falsely. So her, if, if you look here, this is like probably where her back would end, but her back continues here. Um, he's elongated her tailbone to give a dramatic curve. He's also um, shortened her thigh here. So there's some foreshortening happening to make her fit kind of in this dramatic way. Um, she does, she looks a little bit, it's more successfully done than when we saw the Titian um, in that way. He's also uh, draping her in what would have been kind of, um, it would, it, it's called Orientalism. So it's, it's the concept of, of taking kind of objects and things and exoticizing stuff from the East. So um, from this, some of these things are actually Turkish. Um, these are kind of accoutrement all around her. Um, so, so this um, is supposed to kind of make people think of a harem. Um, and so she is looking directly at the viewer, inviting them in and whatnot. So it's along that kind of old school canon that we talked about. <laughs> 